ever since the rebellion of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in those early days of creation, the world has been marred by sin, broken, in fact, by the sins of men and women. And although, uh, although human culture constantly changes, human nature never changes, which is why you can examine any group of people in any culture in any part of the world at any point in history, and you will not only find those people committing sins, but you will find them committing the same sins over and over and over again, which is true of all people in all places, including Christians in the church. In A.D. 49, the Roman Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome because of the unrest that was being stirred up within the Jewish community over the gospel of Jesus Christ at the time because the Jews who had not yet come to Christ were taking issue with those Jews who had and it was causing considerable strife between them and so Claudius had them banished from the city and as a result of that displacement of the Jewish community which is mentioned by the way in Luke uh, by Luke in Acts 18 too. also it's described in detail uh, by the first uh, century Roman historian Suetonius as a result of that the churches in and around Rome which were established by Jewish Christians right, they were suddenly under the sole control and guidance of Gentile Christians who remained who were not banished from the city and as you can imagine, things changed in the church significantly. The way they worshipped, what they taught concerning the Mosaic law, how they evangelized, it was all different from the Jewish Christians to the point that as the Jews slowly began returning to Rome over the years, their issues weren't as much with each other as they were with the Gentiles who were running the churches there because the Jewish Christians still observed the Old Covenant law while the Gentile Christians lived free from those Mosaic restrictions. And so uh, there was a lot of finger pointing going on at the time between them about who was actually living according to God's word and who was still under the bondage of sin. It sounds familiar. And yet the, the truth is, at the bottom of it all, these Christians, if we're being honest, they were more concerned about validating themselves than they were in building each other up. And as a result, the Apostle Paul penned his now famous letter to the Christians in Rome, both Jews and Gentiles in the church, where in chapter 3, verse 23, he says, Hey, let me just remind you, all of you, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, you can stop pointing your fingers at each other because no matter what your background is, no matter what your upbringing was like, no matter how religious or irreligious you are, every single one of you is guilty, broken by sin. And the reason that statement by Paul should matter to us is because it's as true today as it was then. In fact, from the first bite of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden right up to today, every single human being on earth, every single one of us, has been deeply and profoundly affected by sin, right? both the sins of others and our own. And although we cannot always do much about the sins of others, we can always do something about our own because sin is always a choice that we make. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Because human beings have been making that choice to sin ever since the beginning of time, the world as a result, of course, is broken. It was broken in the first century and it is broken in the 21st century. Broken by a lie. You understand? Because ultimately, that's what sin is. It is believing in a lie more than you believe in the truth. In fact, underlying every sin ever committed by every human being throughout all of time, there is a lie that someone believed in more than they believed in the truth. And make no mistake about it, what you believe in more than anything else will set the course for your life more than everything else. It's a fact. What you believe in more than anything else will set the course for your life more than everything else. And and, and now we get to the heart of the matter because this is the real problem with sin. It's not the fact that you did something you were commanded not to do. That's actually a symptom of the real problem. The real problem is the reason behind that disobedience. It's what you've placed your faith in, what you've chosen to believe in more than anything else. That's actually why we're saved by grace through faith and not by grace through the law, because it's not about what you do and don't do. It's not about a list of rules. It's about what you actually believe in more than anything else. 
which of course begs the question, what do you believe in more than anything else? Because there are a lot of people, listen, there are a lot of people who believe in Jesus. They just believe in themselves a little more. Right? It's the same lie that Lucifer believed in more than he did in what God said to him. It's the same lie that Adam and Eve believed in more than they did in what God said to them. It's the same lie that Judas believed in more than he did what Jesus said to him. And it's the same lie that many Christians believe in today more than we do in what God's word says to us. The lie that says it's okay to believe in yourself more than anything else. Of course, we don't think of it that way. But if you look at how so many believers live their lives, it's hard to deny that many of us, if we're being honest, whether we want to admit it or not, many of us believe in ourselves more than we do in Jesus Christ. It's not that we don't believe in him. You understand, when you're a child of God, a follower of Christ, when you've submitted your life to him and received his spirit inside of you, your sins are eternally forgiven. You're no longer under the bondage of sin. And yet we still sin. Why? Because we believe the lie. The lie that says we should come first, which is the foundation that all sin is built upon. It's not that we don't believe in Jesus, we just believe in ourselves a little more. It's not that we don't trust him, it's just that we trust ourselves a little more. It's not that we don't love him, we just love ourselves a little more. It's the lie that is at the root of all of our sin, the lie that says it's okay to put myself first. It's exactly what happened in Eden, as we'll see, as we continue working our way through the creation story, where the progression of sin that we began talking about a couple of messages ago continues to play out in the lives of these very first human beings, Adam and Eve, which culminates in the two of them believing this lie that we're talking about today. But you understand it never starts there. Right? I mean, uh, uh, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I think I'll believe in a lie today. No, it begins with something that is seemingly far more benign, something much more veiled than an outright lie. The progression of sin in our lives begins when we entertain temptation, which was the first point in this two-part message titled The Fall, which we covered last time, and it ends with us being separated from God. Listen, even as believers... Sin affects our relationship with God. And again, we covered all of that in detail in the first half of this message. So if you missed that sermon, you'd do well to watch it or listen to it when you can because it frames the context for part two of this message, which we're covering today, where it's important that we not only understand the progression of sin in our own lives, but that we expose the lie that is at the root of all of it. Okay, so let's pick the story up where we left off last time at Genesis chapter 3. We're going to start by reading verses 8 through 13. This is uh, just after Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent, then ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? The one tree in the entire garden which they were commanded not to eat from. And so their eyes are open now to their own nakedness, and they're ashamed for the first time since God created them. So chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. At the first half of this message, we covered the verses 1 through 7 of the chapter where the serpent tempted Eve, which, by the way, is not in any way, shape, or form credited to the fault of Eve. Okay? Uh, In other words, experiencing temptation is not a facet of sin. The fact is, temptation is an inevitable part of living in a fallen world, okay? For Adam and Eve, experiencing temptation wasn't the problem. Entertaining temptation was, which was also the first point in this message that we covered last time. It's where the progression of sin begins in our lives. So you understand it's not the presence of temptation that leads us into sin. Temptation is everywhere. It it is rather 
when we entertain that temptation that we get ourselves into trouble because uh, temptation always dishonors the name of God, A, of your outline last week, right, or two weeks ago. Uh, B, temptation always contradicts the word of God, and C, temptation always challenges the authority of God. And, and again, we covered all that already, so I'm not going to go over it again today other than to point out where entertaining temptation can lead us. Because Adam and Eve, who just moments earlier, right, moments before this, Adam and Eve were in perfect relationship with God. And now, at this point in the story, they're in an utter state of panic, afraid of God for the first time in their lives. They're hiding from their creator. We, we breeze over this part of the story because in modern church history, we've, we've interpreted this passage simply as Adam and Eve being embarrassed or maybe convicted about their sin, so they're trying to avoid God who's otherwise on his daily friendly stroll through the garden in the cool of the day. Listen, that's not at all what was happening here in the story. Okay, to understand the sheer intensity of this scene, the horrifying reason that Adam and Eve were actually hiding from God in fear for their own lives. We need to understand the way the ancient Hebrew people to whom this story was written originally understood it, which again is very different from what most of us have probably been taught in church. Verse 8 says that Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The word sound in the ancient Hebrew is kol. It can refer to all kinds of sounds depending on the context it's used. One example being Exodus 9, 23 through 34, where it refers to the thunder of judgment, which it always does in the context of sin being exposed. The thunder of judgment. Keep that in mind. As you look at the phrase in the cool of the day, the Hebrew word cool is ruach. It means either spirit or wind. It especially means a violent wind when the judgment of God is at play, when sin is exposed. And then the word day, yom, in the Hebrew, when used in the context of God's judgment or God's anger where sin is exposed, refers to a violent storm, such as we find in Isaiah 27, 8, Zephaniah 2, 2. By the way, in many other uh, ancient Semitic languages, such as the Akkadian language, the word always and only is used to refer to a violent storm. Right? And it's always related to the judgment of a deity. So when you factor all of that in to the context of what was happening in our story here, listen, the first human beings on earth staging a rebellion against the direct command of God himself, bringing about a curse upon the entire earth, the judgment of God, which will profoundly affect all of its inhabitants thereafter, Right? It makes far better sense to read this verse the way those early Hebrew people would have understood it. The literal translation using the words in the context of God's judgment over sin that was clearly happening in this passage. When you factor all of that in, we can translate this verse directly as saying, they heard the roar of the Lord moving about in the garden in the wind of the storm. Doesn't it make much more sense? That Adam and Eve, who for their entire existence up to this very moment had only known the creative, compassionate, loving, and very personal aspects of God's nature, doesn't it make sense that they're running and hiding for their very lives as the God of the universe for the first time in their existence was thundering through the garden in a violent storm in response to the evil of sin that had invaded the innocent perfection of his creation for the very first time and so terrified they cover themselves as best they can and they run for cover but there was nowhere to run because the omnipotent omniscient and omnipresent God was coming straight for them and in the all-consuming fire of his presence in a raging storm Adam and Eve were undone and the moment he calls them out for their sin, everyone starts pointing fingers. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. The serpent claims no responsibility at all. No one owns up to their own sin because they chose to believe a lie. And it is believing a lie that is the very essence of sin. And what was the lie they believed? Well, it wasn't the fact that the serpent told Eve their eyes would be opened if they ate of the forbidden fruit. No, that, that was actually true. 
So what was the lie? It wasn't the fact that the serpent said they would become like God and that they would know good and evil if they ate of the fruit. No, that was actually true. You see, the lie that Adam and Eve believed was that it would be good for them to put what they wanted ahead of what God wanted. You understand, this is the essence of sin in this world. When we put our will ahead of God's will, when we believe in ourselves and what we tell ourselves more than we do in God and what he said to us. And the result is nothing less than a catastrophic devastation in our lives and in the lives of those who love us, which is the inevitable conclusion to the progression of sin in our own lives, as we're going to see as we continue reading. Verses 14 through 16. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So in verses 14 and 15, God pronounces a curse upon the serpent where he says, On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. In ancient Near Eastern literature, the uh, the depiction of someone eating dust or dirt was always a description of the netherworld, of hell. Which again, we find not only in Hebrew literature, by the way, but also in the Gilgamesh epic. It's a collection of Sumerian poems from ancient Mesopotamia, also in the the Descent of Ishtar. It's an ancient Akkadian poem. There are many others. So this curse upon the serpent is not only referring to the physical curse of crawling in the dirt and on its belly, but it's very much the spiritual and eternal curse of hell for introducing sin to humanity. And then verse 16, God speaks directly to Eve where he says, I will surely multiply your uh, pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you, which is the first consequence of believing the lie of sin that we find affecting the human race, where we see that the lie of sin separates us from each other. Right, because it creates conflict between us. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14, the apostle Paul poses the question, what fellowship has light with darkness? And again, to fully understand this, we have to understand the passage the way the Hebrews understood it because to the ancient Hebrew man or woman, your entire identity was entirely wrapped up in the entire community of the Jewish people. In other words, ancient Hebrew culture was group-centered, where the whole of the community was seen as a single unit that was inextricably linked one to the other. It was also then the very basis of not only how they viewed life, but how they viewed the fall of mankind and the eventual victory over our enemy. So look, when verse 15 says... I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Our traditional church interpretation of that verse, at least in in modern history, has been to recognize the offspring of Eve as Jesus Christ. According to Romans 16, 20, where Paul says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. But again, that is not how the early Hebrew people read or interpreted this verse at all. First of all, the messianic expectation of Israel didn't even come into being uh, until the concept of a future king from David's line was part of the collective consciousness of the Jews much later. Secondly, nowhere in the entire Old Testament is Genesis 3.15 included in the messianic expectations of Israel, nor does any intertestamental literature at all reference Genesis 3.15 in its messianic writings, including what you would expect in the abundantly rich messianic writings of the Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's not there. Thirdly, of all the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament identified in the person of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, there's not one direct reference in all of the New Testament that Jesus Christ fulfills Genesis 3.15. Again, the closest thing we have is Romans 16.20, which we'll come back to in a moment. Here's the point. Although no one is denying that it is certainly Jesus Christ who will ultimately defeat our enemy, of course, the Bible is very clear about that in many places, but this particular verse, Genesis 3.15, is referring to the community of believers. It's referring to God's people as the offspring of Eve who are victorious 
over the enemy, which is how the ancient Hebrew people understood this scripture to begin with, that the fellowship of community would eventually be restored in victory over the enemy, which Romans 16, 20 actually confirms. When Paul says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under whose feet? Paul says your feet. Well, whose feet are your feet? Paul wrote this letter to the church. You see, he's saying that Jesus will soon crush Satan under our feet. You and me, under the feet of the church, the community of God's people. Paul's actually contradicting what the modern church has been teaching about Genesis 3.15 for generations. Why? Because he was a Jew who understood what Genesis 3.15 actually meant. And here's why all of that should matter to you. Because we see in verse 16 that Adam and Eve's sin was guaranteed to tear at the very fabric of the relationships that community was based upon. And isn't that exactly what we see happening today? Think about it. In every relationship where there's conflict, if you look close enough, what you will find at the root of that conflict is at least one of the people involved believing the lie that what they want is more important than anything else. If you're at odds with someone else in your life and you're choosing to remain in conflict with that person until you get what you want, regardless of what God's word says, that is sin. Because you've chosen to believe the lie that what you want is more important than what God wants. Listen, the number of Christians today who willingly choose to allow their marriages to disintegrate over what they want, regardless of what God's word says about that marriage, is staggering. It's the lie that tears marriages apart. It's the lie that tears friendships apart. It's the lie that tears families apart. It's the lie that tears churches apart. It's the lie that destroys community among God's people. Believing that what we want is more important even than what God wants. This is the very lie that has denigrated the moral fabric of our society to the point that we're no longer willing to even distinguish good from evil. To the point that we value what we want more than we value human life itself. Old Testament scholar John Walton writes, when a high school student who has hidden her pregnancy suddenly and prematurely delivers her child, and in a panic of confusion discards it in a dumpster, criminal charges are pursued and news programs are filled with compassionate stories of how the baby's life was saved. Not a mile away in the dumpster of an abortion clinic, one can find the fragments of a child the same age torn piece by piece from the womb of an equally confused high school student by the forceps of a certified physician. And the same news reporters who were horrified by the first student's actions support the claims to the rights of the second student and her doctors to exercise choice. The lie of sin tears at the very fabric of the community that the Father created us to live in with other people. And so thank God for Romans 16, 20, which promises the restoration of that community as our enemy is defeated once and for all by Jesus Christ under the feet of the church. It also means that we as the church have a responsibility to reject the lie that what we want is most important and instead show the world that what God wants is what's best for all of us. And we do that how? We do that by being living examples in our own relationships every single day. Preferring one another over ourselves. Honoring his word over our desires when those two are not the same and rejecting the lie that anything, including and most of our, ourselves, should ever come before Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading, verses 17 through 19. And to Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So after addressing Eve, God now turns his attention to Adam, where he pronounces a curse over everything that was originally given to Adam to rule over and to enjoy. 
so that what once existed for Adam's pleasure now exists for Adam's survival as the imminent threat of death looms over his daily life. Because he believed a lie, he must now procure food to keep himself alive. Because he believed a lie, he must now reproduce to keep the human race alive. Because he believed a lie, he must now contend with the earth to get what he needs in a way that he never did before. Because he believed a lie, there is now an urgency to Adam's existence that he's never had to face before. You see, for Adam, everything has changed. Adam and Eve thought that by eating the forbidden fruit, they would gain autonomy, independence from God, when instead, because they believed a lie, they were now more dependent on the mercy and graciousness of God and His creation, and especially each other, than ever before. What was once freely given must now be earned through struggle and pain and toil, all because they believed a lie that said if they put themselves first, they would receive a greater blessing. When in reality, the lie of sin separates us from God's blessing. It's, it's not that, of course, that we no longer receive his blessings. We certainly do. It's just that the, ma uh, the manner by which we receive them has changed drastically because of sin, which was now being reflected in the loss of harmony that humans once had with the entire natural world, not just the Garden of Eden. In ancient times, the, the philosophical worldview of the Greeks was Hellenistic, which among other things meant to them that there was a separation in every part of their lives. So work, uh, recreation, religion, worship, community, God, individuals, everything was separated for its own existence and its own purpose. Whereas the Hebrew people were holistic in their thought, meaning everything to them was interconnected specifically by God. So work, recreation, religion, worship, community, God, individuals, right? All of it was sacred to them because it all belonged to God and came from God in the form of blessings to us. And so when Adam and Eve chose to believe the lie that what they wanted should come before what God wanted, look, they, they didn't just break a specific rule or a specific command not to eat from a particular tree. No, they violated the entire sacred balance between God and all of his creation. This is a devastatingly tragic event that would affect the way that humanity experiences God's blessings for the remainder of our time on this earth. Okay, the truth is, you cannot overstate the magnitude of this curse on the natural world because of the lie that Adam and Eve chose to believe in. And that's just how sin works in our lives today. The lie of sin will always tell you what you stand to gain without ever telling you what you stand to lose. So I, I just think if, if we could simply learn to take pause when temptation comes... Right, to take some time to actually consider the innumerable blessings in your life that you stand to lose by believing the lie of sin. If you would do that when experiencing temptation and just allow the reality of what you stand to lose to knock the wind out of you before you take that leap. I think a lot less people would jump headlong into the lie of sin that says I should come first. I know that would have been true in my life many, many times. In fact, I can't tell you how many people I've counseled and met with over the years who have experienced devastating losses because of sin. And they've said to me, if I could just go back and talk to myself before all this started, I never would have done what I did because it wasn't worth everything that I've lost, not by a long shot. See, the lie of sin it will always tell you what you stand to gain without ever telling you what you stand to lose. Ravi Zacharias, a man, unfortunately, who experienced this firsthand in his own life, he once said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Okay, whatever it is that sin is promising you, I guarantee you, whatever it is that you stand to gain from believing the lie of sin, it is not worth all that you stand to lose. Not by a long shot. Let's finish the story for today, verse 20, to the end of the chapter. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. 
And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So at the end of this tragically sad chapter in the history of humankind, we're simultaneously given signs of a future hope, and at the same time, the devastating reality of the most serious consequences of sin. First, uh, Adam names his wife Eve, which means life giver. Second, God clothes them, uh, right? He, He kills an animal, an innocent animal, to cover their sin, their nakedness. Right, he's covering their shame. Obviously, he's doing that because he still loves and cares for them, even in their own sin. These are all allusions to the future hope of our new life in Christ. And yet, at the same time, God drives Adam and Eve out of the garden, out of paradise, and most importantly, out of the constant fellowship with him that they were used to. Right, where they had to now face the harsh reality that the lie of sin separates us from God. Of course, we know that as unbelievers, We were completely severed from any relationship with God whatsoever. But when we come into relationship with Christ, you understand your sins are forgiven because Jesus took care of every one of them on the cross. Every sin you've ever committed, every sin you're ever going to commit was atoned for one time, once for all, through his shed blood on the cross. Period. Full stop. Which means we are righteous in Christ. And yet, obviously, we're not perfected yet, not until the day of redemption, which means, of course, that still, even as Christians, we still sin. We still, at times, believe the lie of sin. We, we still fail. We still put ourselves first at times. And every time we do that, listen, there's a very real effect on how we are able to relate to God in that moment. And we talked about this in part one of this sermon two weeks ago, how the apostle Peter wrote to Christians In 1 Peter 3, 7, he said that our prayers can actually be hindered by our sin. The Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in Ephesians 4, 30, that our sin can actually grieve the Holy Spirit. James, the brother of Jesus, talks about the effects of sin on the Christian in James chapter 2. The Apostle John talks about the effects of sin on Christians in 1 John 1. The fact is, When Christians believe the lie of sin, our fellowship with God is deeply affected because sin pushes us away from God. That's why we need Jesus, right? Because only Jesus can bridge that gap. Only he can span the chasm that our sin creates between us and God. And yet again, to truly understand the depth of destruction that sin causes in our relationship with the Father, we have to understand this chapter in the story of humanity the way the early Hebrews did. Because in our modern thinking, we tend to see the great tragedy of sin in light of what it has done to us. But not so for the Hebrew. Not at all, no. And in, in Israel, the greatest tragedy of the fall was not the change in human nature or the change in the heart condition of mankind. No, for the Hebrew, the greatest tragedy of the fall was the loss of access to the presence of God. In fact, throughout the rest of the Old Testament, notice no one ever talks about regaining the comfort of Eden or the perfection of paradise like we do all the time. You won't find it. Throughout the whole Old Testament, no one talks about regaining Eden or the perfection of paradise. But over and over and over and over again, they talk about regaining access to the presence of God. For Israel, the overwhelming loss in the fall was not paradise or a perfect life. No, the overwhelming loss for Israel was the loss of the presence of the Father. Again, John Walton writes, the bulk of Old Testament literature regarding sin comes in the ritual text like Leviticus 1 through 7, where the greater emphasis is on the effect of our sin on God. Sin defiles God's presence and prevents us from access to him. The most vile aspect of human sin is not what it did to each of us, but what it did to God. Our sin is a desecration of God. This desecration does not alter who God is, but it dishonors him. The most lamentable result of sin to an Israelite is not that it makes people bad, but that it makes God distant. 
The lie of sin separates us from God. And isn't it telling that that is how it all started with Lucifer in the very presence of God himself? The name Lucifer means morning star, day star. We know from Ezekiel 28 verses 13 and 15 that God assured Satan or Lucifer that he was a created being, that Lucifer was a created being. And in verse 12, he says that Lucifer was a signet of perfection full of wisdom. So Lucifer was clearly not stupid or simple-minded. No, he was in fact brilliant, incredibly intelligent and wise, not to mention the fact that he was one of the few beings created who was in the presence of God himself around the clock. So how could this extremely intelligent, wise, in the inner circle of God angel who is face to face with the almighty God on a constant basis, how could he of all people possibly think that he could become like God? It seems Hard to imagine, doesn't it? That someone so intelligent, so perfect in fact, someone who's constantly in the presence of God would actually believe that he could become like God. Unless, unless he didn't actually believe that he was created. What if Lucifer came to believe a lie? There are many scholars and theologians who've suggested that he must have believed that he and the other angels and God actually came about out of nothing. And over time they evolved into their ultimate state of existence and only because God had formed or evolved before them he was able to deceive so many of the angels into believing that they were actually created by him. In other words, maybe Lucifer convinced himself that God was pulling a fast one on the angels and so believing his own great lie and blinded by his own pride, verse 17 of Ezekiel 28 says that he corrupted his wisdom and we know that he began to believe a a lie, his own deception, believing that he would become like or could make himself like God according to Isaiah 14, 13 and 14 and of course much of our modern society believes what? that we evolved out of nothing and that we are like gods in our own right, ever evolving into a higher state of existence. And what did Satan, the deceiver of the whole world according to Revelation 12, 9, what did he say to Eve that would happen to her if she ate of the forbidden fruit? He said that she would become like God. It makes sense, doesn't it? That Lucifer would use his own deception to deceive the world. What we know for certain is that whatever lie he believed, it separated him from God, the greatest tragedy of our sin. The fact of the matter is, whatever it is that you believe in more than anything else, that will set the course for your life more than everything else. What you place your faith in What you choose to believe in will determine where your life ends up. That's what happened to Lucifer. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. That's what happened to Israel. And that is what has been happening in the lives of men and women ever since. Right? It's not that Lucifer didn't believe in God. Obviously, he did. He just believed in himself a little more. Adam and Eve believed in God. But for at least a moment, they believed in themselves a little more. Israel believed in God, but at times throughout their history, they believed in themselves a little more. And I think there are a lot of Christians today who believe in Jesus. Sometimes we just believe in ourselves a little more. Which is the lie that is at the root of all of our sin. And there's only one remedy. There's only one antidote. There's there's only one answer that can set us free from that lie. And his name is Jesus. He's the truth that conquers every lie. He's the truth that defeats every deception. He's the truth that overcomes the bondage of the lie of sin in our lives. Which means no matter how far you may have fallen away from God in your own life. You understand the truth is Jesus can overcome that lie and he can redeem your life today. In fact, he wants to do that for you right now. 
Let's pray.